the final speaker for our panel today, Emily Lamond, with her paper, Enslaved and Disabled, A Discourse on Epictetus. Emily Lamond is a PhD candidate in the Interdepartmental Program in Ancient History at the University of Michigan, and is currently the Constance and Mark Jacobson Graduate Fellow in the Institute for the Humanities. She is finishing a dissertation about disability and the social construct of the Roman familiar in the late Republic and early empire. This paper contains content warnings for physical violence, slavery, sexual exploitation, ableist terminology and attitudes. But without further ado, over to you, Emily. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. And may I just say thank you so much to the organizers, uh, to my fellow panelists and to the attendees for tuning in. This has been so fun so far. I didn't know conferences were allowed to be fun. <laughs> and uh, I, I really appreciate uh, this space. So I just wanna alert quickly, uh, I am, there's a lot of material, so hopefully I won't run over. Um, and also I might not be attentive to the chat. Uh, so apologies if it's happening and, and I'm not happening in it. <laughs> okay, so, oops, oh dear. All right, um, so I'm going to talk today about the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, and my goal is to approach an understanding of him as a person in the round, situated in the history of disability, by trying to treat his writings as an example of life writing. So here's a quick outline that if you have the slides you can refer to throughout, and I'll open by expanding a little bit on some caveats. So first, this is experimental and a work in progress uh, for me. I'm not an expert in philosophy nor an expert in life writing, but I thought this conference would be an ideal space in which to explore the unfamiliar in an experimental way. And I thank you for your patience in joining me on this journey. So there are words and ideas throughout this presentation that have to do with transphobia, homophobia, ableism, sexism, slavery, and physical violence. So it really runs the gamut, uh, and I apologize as these elements do occur throughout the presentation. From the limited background, uh, the limited biographical information that we have, we know Epictetus lived from the first into the second century CE, that he was a freedman, uh, and at some point in his enslavement he was owned by Epaphroditus, the freedman of Nero. We also know that he had a mobility impairment, as he is described, and indeed one time describes himself as holos, um, which means someone with a mobility impairment. <clears throat> How he came to have this impairment isn't clear to us. Um, it's presented differently in different sources, so one of them explains that his owner at some point did it to him. Um, other sources say it was congenital, others that it was acquired through aging. So long story short, we don't know, and I don't know that the question of what happened to Epictetus is really uh, necessarily something we need to exercise ourselves over. He was originally from Phrygia, then spent time at Rome learning philosophy under Musonius Rufus, uh, and he was then exiled for being a philosopher from Rome and ended up in Nicopolis in Epirus. His particular flavor of philosophy was Stoic. In a crude rendering from this non-expert in philosophy, <laughs> the Stoic philosophy of Epictetus's work uh, really emphasizes turning toward or choosing things that are good for the soul and turning away from things that are bad. Uh, what you have control over is internal to you and spiritual and rational, and what you don't have control over is external, and that includes the body. Um, so the body and anything and views of other people, all of that is indifferent, is immaterial to you. You shouldn't spend time worrying about these things because you have no control over them anyway. You should worry about what's going on within your own spirit, soul, mind. So I want to think about the fact that Epictetus was a person who experienced slavery and disability, and how these experiences might have interacted with his ideas and with who he was as a person. In biographies ancient and modern, whereas Epictetus's slavery is omnipresent, uh, the embodiment of Epictetus as disabled or otherwise isn't mentioned at all, <laughs> or at least if it is, there's a certain symbolic or metaphorical meaning that becomes attached to his disability in itself in a kind of narrative prosthesis. Um, narrative prosthesis, for anyone who is unfamiliar, is a phrase coined by David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder. Meaning comes to hang around disability as a prop. They explain that, quote, disability is a narrative device in narrative prosthesis, an artistic prosthesis that reveals the pervasive dependency of artistic, 
cultural and philosophical discourses upon the powerful alterity assigned to people with disabilities. In short, disability characterization can be understood as a prosthetic contrivance upon which so many of our cultural and literary narratives rely." End quote. So to give an example from an ancient context, a narrative prosthetic move is made by Fronto in one of his letters, in which Epictetus's mobility impairment becomes part of a narrative of Epictetus overcoming his lack of soundness of feet with the eloquent soundness of his speech. This overcoming idea, overcoming one's disability to achieve exceptional greatness among non-disabled people, sounds redolent of the supercrip figure with which you might be familiar. A similar effect, but to an attenuated and even arguable degree, I will concede, occurs in the work of a modern author, Peter Moser, or Peter Moser. <laughs> uh, I must say, he is the only modern author really to think through Epictetus's mobility impairment qua disability, so I don't want to cast aspersions at him. Uh, he, he is doing essentially elements of what I'm trying to do, that is to look at Epictetus as a disabled subject and how his experiences as a disabled person might have influenced his thought. But Moser then uses this exploration to ask, what can Epictetus's engagement with his mobility impairment teach us? Um, and all he points to is a movement in modern psychotherapy and the importance of self-acceptance. So, on the other hand, as I mentioned, there's a strange erasure of Epictetus's disability in some approaches to him. I want to draw your attention to this engraved portrait. This is from the front matter of a 1715 translation of Epictetus's Enchiridion, or handbook. Uh, in the image, Epictetus sits at a table, and his right hand is poised above a book with a pen in hand, and as he turns to look behind him, his left hand supports his head, and prominently in the image, running from behind his head, all the way down through his legs to the floor is a crutch. This image that gives us to know that Epictetus is being represented as someone who uses an assistive technology is this whole image is used as the cover of a modern English translation of a landmark text in studies on Epictetus, Bonhoeffer's text translated by Stevens. But Epictetus's disability doesn't play a strong role in that text necessarily. So while there's this image of someone who is disabled with his assistive technology taking center stage, his disability is somewhat passed over in the actual text in a strange dissonance. I want to introduce also the epigram that appears at the bottom of this image in Greek, which Macrobius in the fourth century CE uh, tells us Epictetus wrote himself. Um, modern authors, including Old Father, who's the editor of the Loeb edition of the complete works of Epictetus, Modern authors like him don't think that Epictetus actually wrote this. Um, they dismiss it out of hand, saying it's ridiculous, he couldn't possibly have written this, the poem is too proud of his disablement, and bears none of the humane humility that they associate with Epictetus. I'll read my clunky translation first, and then a smoother translation, a uh, somewhat jauntier translation of McNaughton underneath. So, an acquired slave Epictetus I was, as Epictetus means acquired, an acquired slave, Epictetus I was, and I was thoroughly afflicted of body, and I was an eros, so the beggar from the Odyssey, I was an eros in poverty, and a dear one to the gods. And then the McNaughton, slave poor as Iris, halting as I trod, I, Epictetus, was the friend of God. So this poem represents that the four most important things to know about Epictetus are he was enslaved, he was disabled, he was poor, and while being all of these things, he was pious and or fortunate in the eyes of, in his relationship with, rather, the gods. So whether this is actually something that Epictetus wrote, I'm actually open to the possibility. Call, go ahead and call me foolish, but I, I don't think it's necessarily unreasonable. But what I will be treating as life writing for sure um, is the work of the discourses. Life writing is a genre vital to queer theory, crypt theory, and is by nature a flexible category. So Arian was Epictetus' student and is the reason that we have Epictetus' thoughts in the form in which we have them. So in an appropriately queer, flexible approach to autobiography qua life writing, we can imagine an almost uh, collaborative authorship process, even if not intentionally collaborative, uh, in the, 
process in the discourses, authors, a collaborative authorship process in the discourses, in the sense that Epictetus said things that he thought were important to impart to his likely freeborn male students, and that Arian noted what he thought was important to write down. So the discourses as they survive are a function of these two things and of this relationship. So there's an obvious issue of how authentic all of this is, but Old Father at least seems to read it as an authentic voice, mostly because he doesn't trust Arian's ability to create characters ex nihilo on the basis of Arian's other writings. And I will say as a non-expert, it certainly does read like an authentically individual account. So ultimately on the strength of the opinions of authorities who have worked with Epictetus for far longer than I have, I've decided to accept the text as the closest thing that a Roman historian can get to the life writing of a formerly enslaved and disabled person in second century Rome. So some findings I've noticed in doing this life writing based analysis include one, places in which Epictetus is writing back against structures, or more specifically speaking back against structures, are the most fruitful sites for trying to understand the impact that his life experiences might have had on his thinking. So first, and noted already by others, he writes back against slavery. So as Epictetus likely considered while he was enslaved, he believed it was possible to be free in your mind, even if your body was enslaved. Um, and so scholarship has already made much of how his former enslavement enters into his ideas and approaches, so I won't dwell on it too much, but um, we can imagine that for literally enslaved people, such a, a way of thinking could be conceived of as a hopeful reading. And also, when one imagines Epictetus's text as something he spoke out in a classroom setting to a bunch of freeborn youths, it's quite radical. He uses slavery against others. And so if the students don't understand what he's saying or don't take his ideas on board, he calls them slave to their faces, andropodon or man-footed thing, um, depending on one's reading. There are authors who think he's addressing his past self, but I think he's actually addressing his students. Uh, so if you imagine a room full of freeborn people hearing from a formerly enslaved person that he thinks they're enslaved, if that isn't being a gadfly, I don't know what is. And two, he also sort of writes against what we would understand as ableist attitudes, or at least he writes how to survive, making it through such attitudes. He diminishes the importance of being holos. He diminishes the importance of the body altogether. He even refers to the body in the diminutive, the, the somation instead of the soma. The whole mechanism of Stoic philosophy that he espouses encourages us to think of external things like the body as ephemeral, things over which we have no control. So Epictetus in some ways is responding to ableist thinking by saying, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that I'm holos, it doesn't matter if my leg is maimed because I had no control over it to begin with. Also, he engages with the concept of pity in an interesting way. Although he doesn't connect it with his state of being holos, he, he does claim that one can pity other people who are, who are holos and also people who are deaf and blind, he says. Um, and at the same time as he says you can do that, he also emphasizes that the pity coming from other people is an external that you can and rightfully ought to ignore. He just smiles quietly to himself when people pity him. Um, again, not specifically for being whole loss, but uh, like I say, there is that kind of tenuous connection. So despite his protestations about the insignificance of the body, however, the body and embodiment appear throughout the text. He imagines the philosopher's body doing a number of different things, eating, having sex, crawling on hands and knees to better play with kids, being tortured, facing execution, and being massaged for optimal condition in the context of the baths. He also responds in encounters with other people's bodies. He encourages his students to keep themselves clean because of the smell one can make if one does not. He regards attractive women and boys as temptations that one ought to avoid and that are in different elements in the world. Bodies ultimately form important loci for his philosophical precepts. Are you worrying more about the body than about your soul? That's a problem. At the same time, he doesn't have time for people who don't take care of their bodies. He doesn't want to take on a student who doesn't groom themselves because he thinks that reflects a disinterest in what is beautiful. So given all of this, and thinking of Epictetus's embodiment in his work, we end up with a fascinating product of labor 
uh, so his teaching of students that ends up in Arian's writing, but also the work itself is a labor. So it's an enactment of Stoic philosophical thinking for the good life. Um, he encourages an athletic metaphor for training yourself in the good life, as Trombley notes. Um, it's a labor of living the good life. It's not easy. It's something that everyone ought to be attentive to in a regular way, much like rigorous athletic training. And 15 minutes. Thank you, Emily. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll just jump uh, pretty far forward. Okay. Uh, so Epictetus, uh, something I didn't mention in my abstract, but that did occur to me in the course of creating this presentation is that he also excludes people who don't fit his vision of gender sexuality and approaches to sexual relationships. Um, so I can't go into too much detail, unfortunately, just because I have to move on. But um, he's a complex figure. So on the one hand, he has ideas that feel radically empowering. He also has deeply exclusive ideas. So I also want to argue in the time that I have left that Epictetus is participating in a broader stoic exclusion of queer labor at this time in Rome. So uh, we've sort of been talking, the, the idea of Prodigia have been mentioned briefly uh, earlier today. And so uh, other stoics at Rome do engage in this conversation of uh, entertainers and prodigiousness. Um, and so I'm actually really grateful to Cheryl's mention of Canidoi because uh, this act, the Canidae that appear in Pliny that he disparages um, are occupying this interesting queer space as entertainers uh, that Seneca and Pliny have no time for. Um, so you may think, okay, well, Seneca and Pliny don't have time for these for sort of queer entertainers. And I should say Fatui and Moriones are people who are entertainers by virtue of a perceived cognitive disability. So you may think, well, what what do their, what do Seneca and Pliny's disparagement have to do with Epictetus? I mean, Epictetus never comes out and says that he has these disagreements with entertainments of this kind. But I want to make a few things. So one, Epictetus is not unwilling to categorize people as prodigia. Um, so he, he says that hairy women should be considered a, prodigia, a prodigium and ex exhibited at Rome as such. He also has a distaste for entertainment given by non-philosophers, um, which, uh, which could include the entertainers that Seneca and Pliny have no time for. Uh, and based on what I talked about in the last slide, he also engages in a general dismissal of certain groups of people from his philosophical labor. Um, so people who are mad and cognitively disabled, um, and also people who don't fit his vision of gender sexuality and approaches to sexual relationships. Um, so he constructs this idea of worthy occupation, that is his pursuit of virtue, this philosophical pursuit of virtue, but queer, mad, cognitively disabled labor has no part in the labor that he's engaged in. Okay, Epictetus has a fraught legacy. Uh, at more rigid elements of his thinking get picked up by some sects of Christianity, my modern psychotherapy, for example. Um, and at the same time as he has this fraught legacy, I also want to convey to you an image Ep of Epictetus as an entire person. Um, he has these interesting resonances as well with modern disability thinking. You know, in, in the midst of his exclusionary ideas, he also has these ideas like human frailty, dignity, interdependence. He even questions capital punishment, might be a cultural relativist, it, all of these things that seem, um, seem to have an interesting uh, impact on it's interesting resonances with disability thinking. Uh, so I just want to end this somewhat rambling discourse <laughs> uh, with a question, uh, which is, is this a fair project? Should I be doing this? You know, to begin with, even putting Epictetus in a moralizing frame, is this too ahistorical? Is it something I should even be interested in? And finally, more importantly, perhaps, is it ethical that I'm engaging in Epictetus' life writing, considering I mean, yes, he just self-identifies as holos, but given his overarching framework and his commitments to not being embodied, his body doesn't matter to him. So should I force his body to matter? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.